And this, this um, th social credit is an interesting phenomenon because they're not doing it for free. By joining this process, they become known in a collective that then, uh, knowing each other, they can in fact help themselves to get a sinecure somewhere, to get tenure, so that there is in fact a job and an economic value to this free work ultimately. But it is almost impossible to gauge it in advance. Say, oh, if I give X amount of work, then that will increase my chances of tenure by Y. It's much more amorphous than that. It's more you join the tribe, you pay attention to the rest of the characters, you begin to do the kind of micro-social work that tribe, or and I mean tribe in the sense of primate tribe, going way back into the Paleolithic and even to our primate ancestry, this kind of work with other face-to-face -face members of a tribe is something that is not economized, it's not monetized, and yet it is a way of uh, going forward in the world. So sometimes this is called open source, open source results in the biological community that you do your scientific work and you put it out there for free. You make sure that it escapes the corporate uh, privatization system by simply publishing it and putting it out for free. And this is happening a lot, for instance, in genetically uh, uh, modified organisms and in computer programming. Uh, so there again, we have a kind of a gift economy. And then also there's odd residuals. So the, 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 the training of a scientist resembles the training that you would get in a guild in the Middle Ages. So it's pre-capitalist in that sense. You have a, a master apprentice system that moves on and that, that is a, a somewhat of a, a lifelong uh, relationship. So, what happens, I think, is that um, a different uh, structure of feeling is constructed in that community that operates different than capitalism and is functioning within it. And it's not just that scientists are a particular personality type. That's going back to some, I mean, maybe that is a factor, but the, the structure of the community itself creates the personality. It's a structure of feeling in Raymond Williams' sense where scientists don't want to become rich. There, you, there is a sufficiency of means. You can, you can shoot past the level of success that would actually get you what you want and go beyond that into too much success where you get from working on science to working on administration, for instance. And so this is an interesting difference to capitalism where more is always better and getting rich is more or less of an infinite you can't possibly be too rich or too thin. I mean, these things are, 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 are commonplaces in our society. And yet, within the sciences, the, the, the rule seems to come out of one of the oldest um, the phrases in our, uh, proverbs in our language. Enough is as good as a feast. And this, I think the science community would say, is, is, is a physiological fact, that enough is even better than a feast, because a feast makes you sick, whereas enough is enough. And uh, I was talking to a group of scientists about this, and they, I must say, the scientific community is very uncomfortable with this line of my talks. They, they don't <laughs> like this. But one of them said, well, enough is a bad word. That's a bad word in America. Enough sounds like not enough. So um, <laughs> he said, you should change it to Goldilocks, where there's too little, there's too much, and then there's just right. And what you want is just right. And you can easily have too much. So I thought, okay, Goldilocks. <laughs> Uh, I'll change it always and mention that it's not only that enough is as good as a feast, but enough is also just right. <laughs> so, now all the sciences are conciliant. This is something that needs to be remembered. And E.O. E. Wilson's book, Conciliance, needs to be read, it, despite its shocking ignorance of the humanities, etc., etc. Nevertheless, needs to be read. For E.O. Wilson, uh, all bridges between the various disciplines that are now uh, have gaps between them that cause problems could be solved. The, the bridge is always sociobiology. <laughs> so it, it is, Wilson is saying, if only everybody would also study what I study, then all solved problems would be solved. And so this is a little bit uh, self-serving and, and, and funny, except for he's studying sociobiology, and so there's a painful truth in it at all points. We remain primates, we remain animals, we have a biological past, we have parameters in our minds that we cannot think our way out of, we have cognitive limitations that we can't avoid even when we have defined them. Um, and uh, this goes against the kind of uh, 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 ancient uh, uh, leftist notion of, of the humanity or of human nature as non-existent or as tabula rasa, 
that essentially we are what our culture makes us. Well, it's always an interaction between environment and heredity, and you can't ignore the hered heredity part of it. And so I think this is Wilson's point. But when he talks about consilience, I think it's important just to remember that the, our medicine works to the extent that it does because it's consilient with chemistry. Medicine is consilient with biology. Biology maps onto chemistry. Chemistry maps onto physics. And physics, at, at both at the part of particle physics level and to cosmology, is congruent across so that these adherences manage to map all the way across. And the interesting question becomes, is that true also of the social sciences? Are the social sciences using the scientific methods such that their results are consilient with the rest of the effort? And then, of course, the humanities raises the question even <coughs> further. But I, uh, putting, setting, that, uh, setting that aside, because that is a, a problem that can't be answered, uh, really, all of this, science is accelerating powers. It's, um, it, I sometimes think of it as a, a cathedral project, multi-generational, not really planned by an architect, a uh, lot of work being done up in areas. And the thing is, this is a four-dimensional or five-dimensional cathedral. This is a science fiction cathedral that's going off into many directions where only the people working up there at the ultimate entablature or the spandrels or whatever knows what's going on in that corner of the, of the cathedral. They can come back down onto the central floor and say, this is what we're doing up there. It's consilient all the way across the board. You yourself can't see or understand what's going on up there, and yet it is expanding at a rapid <coughs> rate of speed. And all of the previous science's uh, good work, solid work, is scaffolding for the work of the next generation. And it continues so that our physical powers in the world are, in fact, expanding quite rapidly. And yet, we uh, are still within a capitalist structure that is basically profit-oriented. The, the entire rule of the culture is non-scientific, but rather economical. And e e e economics is not a science in the same way, in that the equations, even the, the math being used in economics, is being used to describe a legal system rather than a natural system. So that economics should be called uh, quantitative legal analysis. It is not a science. It is, it, it, the numbers are, are cooked. Uh, c consistently and systematically because they are based on, on uh, fundamentals that are, are value-based, that are laws, rather than natural phenomena. So whether e economics could be made more scientific, well, I think it could, but this is a big project that involves everybody, including the humanities. So in this situation that I described to you, we suddenly come to climate change. The game changes at that point because it's a forcing action. And what it is, is an emergency, but it's an emergency that only science can see at this point. So now, the scientific community is coming out of the labs and coming out of the field in a way that they never really have before, especially since that horrible uh, Lyndon Johnson-Nixon moment. But in general, science has always been more content to be in the labs and in the field and not wanted to be involved with public policy until now. And we're seeing something new in history. It has never occurred before that the scientific community has come out and said to the rest of the world, we have to change. The current world order and the way that which humans do business is um, going to destroy the biosphere. The, essentially, the parasite has succeeded to the point where it's going to kill the host organism. And th um, the scientific community regards that to be a bad thing. You know, it would be bad for the lab, it would be bad for their field studies, it would be bad for their descendants. There are many reasons that it would be bad. And so the scientific community has begun this revolution. It is a revolution against suicidal behavior by the culture at large in the way that scientists usually work, through committees, through signing petitions, their professional associations, <laughs> written letters. They have gone to the governments of the world and they have said, Sorry, uh, the, the capitalist rules are not adequate to actually deal with this emergency. Things are going to have to change. And, of course, the capitalist world order is not interested in this. And has said to this point, well, that's interesting, but sorry, we can't possibly change the, the order of business as it exists right now. I mean, capitalism is the world. Is, uh, there, it, the, any differences are unimaginable. 